Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Literary Translation Center. Uh, my name is Daniel Hahn. I'm the program director of the British Center for Literary Translation, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to uh, today's event on translating minority languages. The, the premise of the event is simply that, or at least the, the rationale behind having this event is that even while we see the number of books being translated into English increasing in this country, the, the, uh, an enormous proportion of the, uh, the, the, the oxygen in that marketplace is still being taken up by a very small number of relatively large languages. You will see, uh, if you look at the number, of, uh, the number of books submitted for something like the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, the number of books is going up, but there's still an enormous uh, stranglehold on, uh, on the space, if you like, um, taken by books that are translated from French, German, and Spanish. What I think is quite interesting in relation to the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, as some of you will have seen the shortlist that was recently announced, which only included one book from one of those three big languages, and in fact also had languages like um, Icelandic represented on the shortlist. Um, so we're going to be talking about whether there are some particular challenges facing translators and publishers of work from uh, minority languages. We will at some point in this conversation have to define what we mean by minority languages, which, judging by our, our little a pre-game chat is not going to be as easy as we might have expected. And we're also going to talk about one possible solution and whether, with, whether this is a solution, whether this is an acceptable solution, to use either bridge languages as translations, as means of getting to English from another language, um, and whether it's po uh, acceptable, if you like, also to use what we might call a bridge person, um, a, to do a collaborative translation using a linguist and a, uh, a target language writer. So that is sort of the territory we're hoping to cover. We're going to try and figure out what the, what the issues are and also get some sense of whether there are uh, solutions that we, that we might um, help to uh, propose. I will briefly introduce the four speakers who are here with me. Um, at, at, on my far left is Christopher Meredith, who is a translator from Welsh, um, as well as being a novelist, a poet, and according to his CV, just about every other kind of writer. Um, He's also a professor of creative writing at the University of Glamorgan. Um, he has four novels, the most recent of which, The Book of Idiots, was published uh, like two weeks ago or something, three weeks ago? Yes. Congratulations. Has a new book out, The Book of Idiots, just published a few weeks ago. Um, to Chris's right uh, is Clive Bootle, who's the director of Francis Bootle Publishers, which specializes in translating books from minority languages, publishing uh, books including uh, poetry and drama. Um, in 2006, he launched the Lesser Used Languages of Europe series, publishing both poetry and prose. To his right, Gabriel Rosenstock is an Irish poet and a very prolific translator of poetry with, can this be right? I read this, 150, more than 150 books? <laughs> it's okay. a form of insanity, yes. <laughs> yes, we will be hearing about that. My first question is going to be, how, when? A uh, very prolific uh, translator of, of, of poetry with over 150 books to his name. Um, he has, in particular, written a lot and written a lot about uh, haiku. And to my immediate left is Sampurna Chatterjee, who is a poet, uh, a novelist, a translator, and a, a children's writer. Uh, her books include the poetry collections Sight May Strike You Blind and Absent Masses and the novel Rupture. Um, she translates both into and out of Bengali. Um, we might talk at some point as well about this, this, the fact of working in two different directions and your relationship with those two different languages. I've asked each of the speakers just to say, um, just to talk for about five minutes each, just uh, to introduce themselves and their work, in particular as, as it relates to our, to our subject today. We will then have a little chatter amongst us, amongst ourselves, um, and then we'll leave plenty of time for you to ask questions. So do please, while they're talking, think of fiendish questions for them. Um, shall we start with Chris? Would you just give us a, a little introduction, please? Thank you, Danny. Uh, you've already said uh, quite a bit about me. I think all the important bits. I, I'm ma mainly a novelist and a, uh, also a poet, and I do some other stuff. And uh, because I come from a country where there are two languages, uh, people in my position who are able to speak both tend to get drawn into the world of translation as well. So I was actually born and brought up in a very anglicized part of Wales. And I think the second language I ever heard spoken was Italian on a bus. Uh, apart from that, Welsh I heard on television. Um, but uh, from the age of about 18, um, I became more and more drawn towards the Welsh language and uh, 
uh, acquired the Welsh as a second language to a pretty high level, and I now translate Welsh into English, and occasionally using bridge languages, other languages into Welsh. Um, quite a quite a tricky thing to do. Um, I suppose the situation in Wales, for those who don't know it, is uh, an interesting one, an, an interesting kind of microcosm of uh, the way things are in the world, really, between big languages and uh, lesser used languages, as they're sometimes called. Uh, because you have a population of three, three and a half million, of whom about five, six hundred thousand are Welsh speakers, active, uh, very fluent, first language Welsh speakers, perhaps 300,000. So you've got really, perhaps politically, the biggest language in the world, and one of the ones towards the smaller end of it, next door to one another. And if you're at all sensitive to language, and you can speak both of those, that puts you in a position, perhaps, uh, to have some insights into the relationships between the bigger and the smaller languages in the world. And um, I suppose my experience as a translator is that, uh, first of all, I, I'm asked to translate stuff on the strength of the fact that I'm a writer myself. So it seems to me that when you translate a novel, for instance, in some ways you're redrafting the novel. You're doing another draft of the novel in a certain sense. And it's a, it, 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 to me, it's, it is a creative process. It's, it's one in which you seek to serve the purposes of the, of the source text always. Uh, and as, uh, as Umberto Eco once said, to keep faith uh, with, the, with the source text when you translate from the encyclopedia of one language into the encyclopedia of another. Those are, those are the terms that he uses, and I think they're rather, rather good and rather apposite. And uh, perhaps linguistically it's interesting that Welsh and English are in many ways quite different from one another. Although a lot of the vocabulary gets borrowed back and forth, and both are heavily influenced by Latin, uh, fundamentally, the, the syntax in Welsh is very, very different from English, so that there are certain ways in which it's um, quite extraordinarily different from English, uh, more so than you might expect for languages that have been neighbours for such a long time, and both of which have a, an Indo-European root. Uh, so that's my situation, but, uh, but mainly I'm a writer myself, and uh, I, I sort of moonlight as a translator, and I'm perhaps in a position to give some insights from the, from the lowly translator's point of view uh, between a big language and a small one. Thank you. Could you just say something briefly about, about the role that politics is playing, certainly at least in the last few years, in, in the relationship between these two languages and, and the, the profile that Welsh... Well, you've opened up a can of worms that's <laughs> bigger than five minutes there. Um, uh, of course, it's all, it's all political, and uh, the Welsh language has been a political issue for a long time. In the 20th century in particular, it came to the forefront uh, really from the end of the First World War, uh, when um, language activism uh, became significant. It was at the point where Welsh language started to reach a point of collapse. Mm. Uh, probably the 1870 Education Act, in my opinion, was quite a big blow to the Welsh language. Uh, weirdly, compulsory education had a very seriously bad effect on the Welsh language, because before that, Welsh people learned to read Welsh in chapel. But because they read Welsh, they were regarded as illiterate by the British state. Uh, the 1870 Education Act meant that they had to go to school and learn English. And uh, so there were sort of 40, 50, 60 years of, uh, of education out of the language. And in fact, it continued well on into the second half of the 20th century, to the point where in the 1960s, uh, famously, uh, Saunders Lewis, who was a founder member of the Welsh uh, Nationalist Party, played Cymru in the 1920s, gave a very influential radio lecture uh, on the BBC, ironically, called Tunged ar Iaith, which means the fate of the language. And he said, look, you know, this is the end, it's curtains. By the early 21st century, none of us will speak Welsh anymore. And partly in response to that, and partly in response to some other stuff, uh, the Welsh Language Society was formed, and that was the, kind of the most visible and well-known form of language activism, but th there were others as well. And the ongoing with that, in parallel with that, I, in my opinion, there was a kind of a, there always had been a kind of a, a respectable Welsh language strand in things that had managed to survive. And those two things had a kind of symbiotic relationship, which has partly played uh, a role in uh, the partial recovery of the language, to the point now where... Um, I think in the last census, the, the number of Welsh speakers was seen to go up slightly for the first time in a very long time. Um, for these reasons, it's often seen as a kind of a, a great example of how things can be done. Um, 
However, I don't. I think it's still a fragile situation personally. And uh, while it while it looks good in in the great scheme of things compared to many other languages, um, it's uh, we're not out of the woods yet. Thank you very much. I, I think we will probably return to the question of the question of politics and certainly the way in which a lot of minority languages are promoted is very closely connected to ideas of, of nationalism and statehood. I think this is something we'll probably talk about. Uh, Clive. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm a publisher, um, as you can see, because I'm the only person here wearing a suit. <laughs> I'm also the only person who's shameless enough to bring my uh, merchandise um, uh, 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 for public gaze. Um, yes, I'm the, uh, the world's uh, foremost publisher of uh, Cornish language um, literature. Um, and in, uh, as Danny says, in 2006, uh, I started a, um, I thought it would be a brilliant idea um, for the British public to become more aware of the minority languages of Europe. And so I started um, the Lesser Used Languages of Europe uh, series, which is since uh, 2006, um, I've uh, brought uh, out four uh, anthologies uh, of literatures, uh, uh, Galician, Breton, Channel Islands, Norman, the two dialects, three if you count Serkier, and, um, uh, and, and Manx. Um, and um, it doesn't, hasn't greatly enriched me over the years, and uh, if I do four uh, every uh, six years, I'm now 60, I'm probably not going to get through all the minority languages of Europe. Um, there are uh, about 40 million people who speak uh, the minority languages, um, and uh, I think we, do, we need to do them, uh, those people justice by um, giving them uh, a wider uh, a wider audience, at least in the, in the English-speaking world. Um, so um, some of the languages I, I deal with, uh, as in Cornish uh, and Manx, uh, Manx was, uh, was officially declared extinct in 1974 uh, and now has uh, probably several hundred speakers. Um, Cornish was, um, was declared extinct in 1777 and now has um, several thousand uh, speakers and uh, I suppose that I take some credit for, um, uh, for to some, some extent for the revival uh, of the Cornish language and I'm always reminded of um, George Bernard Shaw who said um, he wasn't sure what, he'd, um, that he, what his contribution to socialism had been in terms of thought, but at least he'd got it printed on decent paper. And um, I, I'm sort of the same, the same opinion with, um, with, with Cornish and, and some of the other minority languages. Um, I suppose because I'm uh, a, 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 an English language uh, publisher, um, I'm uh, lucky enough to be to be to have found translators in all these languages in um, uh, without having to use a bridge language, um, with the exception of a book I did on um, of uh, of the Serbi a Serbian dialect of Romani, which we did actually have to translate through um, with a, with a dictionary uh, from German, um, but that's that's the only one. These anthologies are, the idea is to present the languages from the earliest times to the present day, which is quite a task. And as you can see, well, this is, this is the, uh, they get bigger and bigger as they, as they, as they go on. Um, we're tackling uh, Catalan this year, um, which will probably be the, you know, the width of this table. Um, and and uh, it's, uh, uh, size, size is everything, isn't it, um, ladies and gentlemen? Um, so, that's really all I have to say at the moment. But uh, apart from, apart from, really, I suppose, money. <laughs> That's the issue. We said it earlier. Money. Mm. We can talk about that later. Well, we've, we've resolved today's discussion. Excellent. We can all go home now. Um, can I ask you? Just, do, do you have a do you have a firm definition that you use of what is? A minority language or a lesser used language. I mean, do you have a, do you have hard lines for what is eligible and what is not eligible? Uh, well, no, be because I'm because I'm the boss. Um, I can I can decide exactly what a minority or a lesser used language is. Um, some of them. I mean, I used originally the the the, the European Bureau of Lesser Used Languages um, uh, definition, um, which were uh, languages were which were not the state. Um, uh, the, the, the state languages, the official state languages. 
Um, but uh, as I've gone on, um, I've uh, drawn in new, uh, new definitions based upon um, really nothing at all apart from my own whim. Uh, so that I, now, I now include um, Faroese, which is of course a state language, uh, Icelandic, which is a state language, Irish, which has joint uh, recognition. Um, so I suppose and, and things it, like Catalan, which has a very a very substantial number well, of, of course, speakers compared to some yeah. some first languages. Yeah, Catalan has if you, if you include the dialects of Valencian and, and the Balearic dialects, um, you're talking about 14 million people, which is a which is a which is more than they more than there are, I believe, speak Swedish, and probably Danish and Finnish all put together. Mm. So, yes, uh, they've been very kind about um, accepting the definition of lesser used language, <laughs> even though when you go to Barcelona, they don't think it is a lesser used language. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gabriel. Good morning. I'm Gabriel Rosenstock from Dublin. I'm a poet translator. I use that as a hyphenated word, meaning that I don't really distinguish between being a poet and being a translator. I, I feel that the same flame of creativity uh, lies equally in original poetry and in the poetry I translate into Irish or out of Irish. Uh, one of the strands of my translation work would in fact be trilingual books. For instance, this one, uh, German poet Elke Schmitter. Die Steine fragen mich nach dir. The stones are asking about you. So, with a trilingual book like this, and here's another one by Walter Helmut Fritz, uh, there's a chance of maybe getting three stabs at the cherry, if that's not mixing my metaphors too much, but you know what I mean, somebody might pick this up, in, hopefully in Dublin or at the launch, which the Goethe Institute kindly uh, affords us on an annual basis, and read the poems in German because they're otherwise maybe not available, or read the poems in English, or read the poems in Irish separately or together. So that's one type of readership or audience that we try to achieve. Now, going on to the delicate question of a bridge language, um, I'm, I'm very interested in contemporary poetry from India, and one of the poets who was actually uh, rumored uh, was going to win the Nobel last year, but it was given, of course, a transformer to Sweden, uh, Satchitanandan, who is from Kerala uh, in South India, writes in a, in a language, Malayalam, which is spoken by 26 million people, uh, but many of us have never even heard of it. So this is the situation with languages today. Uh, we haven't heard of many languages or their literatures, and uh, we haven't even heard of many languages uh, whose fate is very, uh, very much in the balance. I mean, somebody once said that a language is dying on this planet every fortnight. That's hard to uh, even think about this morning. So with uh, the case of Satchit and London, English obviously was the bridge language for me. But listen to this. This is the type, this is the reason. That at the back of this volume of poems in Irish by Satchit and London, there's an interview in English and there's reasons for having it in English. But just listen to what he says for a minute. He says, uh, my mother taught me to talk to crows and trees. From my pious father, I learned to communicate with gods and spirits. My insane grandmother taught me to create a parallel world to escape the vile ordinariness of the tiresomely humdrum everyday world. The dead taught me to be one with the soil. The wind taught me to move and shake without ever being seen, and the rain trained my voice in a thousand modulations. My beautiful village with its poor people too must have hurt me into poetry. So every day we poet translators are, I think, hurt into poetry and hurt into translation. And how we do it really is our own business, whether it's with the bridge language or whether we know or whether we're or whether we we know the, 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 the language intimately or academically. It doesn't matter. It's the result that matters and to create something beautiful that does justice to the work and the imagination uh, and the spirit of the original uh, of work. Yeah, thanks very much for the moment. Thank you. Samperna. Uh, yeah, hello. I'll have to add a little bit uh, to what uh, Gabriel just said. Uh, uh, it's worth remembering that Sachidanandan, who writes in Malayalam, translates his own poems into English because he is that fluently bilingual. And uh, that seems to be the case of uh, most Indians. Uh, we are 
all of us have at least three languages. That's because of the way, the nature of our educational system. Uh, so you learn English, you learn the state language. So for example, I, uh, Sampurna Chatterjee, I come from the state of West Bengal, uh, where the state language would be Bengali or Bangla. Uh, the numbers in India, as I'm sure you know, tend to be a bit more mind-boggling than numbers anywhere else. So uh, as for the last census, 85 million people spoke Bangla in, in India alone. Uh, so the question of how do you define a minority language is a bit uh, impossible for me to answer. So I won't even try that. What I will say is how I came into this pool of translators, as it were. It was, as Daniel mentioned yesterday, entirely by accident. I write my original work, that is poetry and fiction in English. Uh, two poetry books, uh, two novels. The new novel is just gone to press. Um, but I fell into this act of translation purely by chance. It was a Bengali writer called Shukumar Rai, uh, who wrote the most marvelous uh, nonsense poetry and prose in Bangla, uh, which I felt was a shame that non-Bengali people couldn't read it. I have to also say that according to the Bengali, the universe is divided into two halves. One which is the Bengali half of the universe, and the other, the non-Bengali, which includes everybody else. So that would give you an idea of how parochial we are in one sense. And uh, Shukumar Rai belong to, belongs to us. We are fiercely possessive of Shukumar Rai. The idea that he could travel into English uh, seems to be almost anathema. Only one resolute academic translated it before I did, way back in 1997. My translation of it was, uh, related to my memory of growing up with Shukumar Rai in a very anglicized uh, uh, environment. I grew up in Darjeeling. I, uh, what Chris said resonated with me because I did grow up feeling like I lived in England because uh, there I was in, uh, at the foothills of the Himalayas, growing up in this public school, British public school, where my father taught English. But nevertheless, the presence of Shukumar Rai's poetry was a very palpable one. Shukumar Rai's lines are part of Bengali conversation. Tash goru goru nae ashulete pakhi she. Or huko muko hangla baritar bangla. We knew these lines before we could read. And I remember when I was thinking about it and the transition from Bengali into English, I was wondering how is it that some of the euphonious rhythms, the joy, the music of that was missing. In, in, in the very, very uh, competent, very academically wonderful, metrically sound translation, I said, why not give it a shot with absolutely no, no, no experience or anything of the sort? And the result was that I did 12, and the publisher, who happened to get hold of them via another friend, said, will you do a book for us? And I said, yes. And yesterday you mentioned the hubris of that, yes. If I had paused for a millisecond, I would never have said yes. But I did, and I'm very glad, because I think without that foolhardiness, I wouldn't have embarked on A, this wonderful journey, B, the fact that a lot of Bengalis have come up to me and said to me uh, uh, that our children, and this is, I guess, where the... Uh, where the uh, concern about Bengali also being beleaguered by the increasing uh, aspiration towards English. A lot of uh, young parents come up to me and tell me that our children can't speak uh, Bengali because we live in Maharashtra where they're le learning uh, uh, Marathi as their uh, second language. But we love Shukumar Rai. We would love him uh, to be known to our children. Thank you for your translation because through that, at least they're getting some sense and some flavor of the original. So that was the beginning of my journey from uh, Bangla into English translation. The other way around happened again entirely by accident. And, um, and um, uh, it was at a, a Literature Across Frontiers workshop at Nimrana in Rajasthan, where an Irish poet known to Gabriel, Garage McLaughlin, I blame it entirely on him, because he wrote a poem which I wasn't even there supposed to be translating anything into Bengali. I was the English poet from India, supposed to look at the English translations and edit them, but I found myself completely taken by this uh, poem by Garage Bariyakh. Uh, if you remember it. And I, uh, 
uh, tr ended up translating it into Bengali, which was a shocking occurrence for me because I have never written one line in Bengali. Uh, and I remember going to Alexandra and saying, you have to listen to this because I think I've just done my first translation into Bengali. And it was this poem called Too Much, which I made into Beshi. It became something of a, of a, of a cult piece at the Jaipur Literary Festival where we presented it. And since then, I have been translating significantly from uh, the Irish, the Welsh, many uh, Welsh poets, uh, Swiss, German, French into Bangla. As my Scottish friend Meg Bateman likes teasing me, she says, it took an Irishman to make a Bengali out of you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sampuna. We'll talk in a moment about, about uh, bridge languages and about the translation process and possibly different translation processes. But let's, let's have a, a quick chat first about, about what makes it difficult, and, and particularly from a commercial point of view. I mean, I think, Clive, you said we have a, we, there's a kind of one word answer to what is the problem, which is money. Um, but I quite like to, to, to tease that out a little bit um, and think about two things. First of all, there should be more money in the system in that we assume there should be more subsidies, there should be more funds coming from somewhere. We can, we can argue about where that money should come from. But is there also a question about the market and about demand? Um, I mean, I ask this partly thinking not just in terms, we've been talking mostly in terms of uh, talking about poetry today, um, but thinking about a, a commercial publisher of fiction, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is it really harder for a, uh, for one of the Bloomsbury's or Faber's of this world to sell a novel which was translated from Catalan than a novel that was translated from Spanish. Just thinking in terms of actually what the, whether, whether there, is, there are different market pressures on these things, quite apart from whether we can find subsidies, whether we can find ways of alleviating the, the, the market issues. I'm not, I'm not sure about that really, but all I know that is if you look at... Um, Say the, the the novels of Bernardo Chaga, which are translated, for, which are uh, from the Basque. Yes. They are actually translate. The, the the translations are from Spanish. Yes. Um. um, uh, um what's his name? The, the the Galician writer um, Manuel Rivas is also. He's he's translated directly from the Galician. But if you look on on the as I do, um, I take a uh, you know an interest, a commercial interest in these things. If you look on the inside. Um, information page of these novels, which have uh, achieved some some standing, you know, in in Britain in, in the marketplace. There, there is a there is a, a, a sentence which says um, thanks or courtesy of the uh, the Spanish cultural and literary um, department. Mm -hmm. So these novelists are 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 being supported by mm -hmm. by their governments. And and to be frank, I mean even I mean uh, whoever publishes them, I don't know Bloomsbury uh, or. Um, they do receive uh, subventions from uh, from from the Spanish government, and I imagine that, that that's probably the case of of many um, European uh, languages, even you know widespread German. I, I, I mean, mm. I don't, I, I really don't know what the situation is. As I said to you earlier, there is a hole in the middle of, um, in terms of um, minority languages, there is a hole in the middle of Europe, and it's called France, mm. because you can't, they do not recognize um, the, the minority languages um, uh, within the precincts of France. Um, so even though there is a, a, lot, a great deal of um, linguistic diversity in, in, in France, Occitan, Breton, Gallo, Franco-Provençal, all those languages are not recognized, and therefore you can't get money from the, the, the French Institute from mm. them. I throw that one out to you. Anyone from France? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right, you will have to defend yourself in just a moment you? on behalf of your entire nation. It's slightly unfair, possibly. <laughs> Apart from the marketplace, uh, Danny, um, the, in, 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 in Britain, in, in, in English, in the English language Britain, uh, there is a kind of cultural climate that works against translated literature somehow. And mm. it's, it's more than just the marketplace, I think. You know, there's just a tiny, as I understand it, I mean, I'm sure Clive would know the figures better than I do, a tiny proportion of literature that's published in Britain is, is in translation. Mm. And it's much tinier than in most other European languages, I believe. Yes. You know, so we actually have um, a kind of a, a climate of cultural indifference to mm. stuff from other linguistic cultures, um, which perhaps we day to day are not aware of simply because, you know, you, you don't know what's not there. Mm. 
there's, you know, um, and there's that that we, we kind of work against if we work as translators. Of course, there are, that's, that's against the situation that we have now in Britain, where you probably can walk down the street and you have far more languages being spoken anywhere in Britain now than ever before. Yeah. And we, I would hope that that's a kind of a, a cultural climate that will change, you know, because I think people who, are, who do live uh, between two languages, which probably covers an awful lot of humanity, you know, to be stuck inside one language is quite an unusual thing, actually, I think, in, in, in world terms. Uh, I would hope that that cultural climate would change. I suppose, we, you know, the, the kinds of things that we do along the way are, are parts of the, perhaps the struggle towards that. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether, it, I, I, the question is, is there a way of speeding it up? Uh, or is it something that's going to be very gradual and incremental? And uh, I, I, I would like to think that it's, there's going to be much more of a linguistic multiplicity rather than an evening out of things, you know? Uh, so I think there's a bigger kind of cultural um, pulse that's going on, you know, on, on a much slower rate, uh, as, as well as the market question. And I think I think that there's maybe something which goes alongside that, which is when we're talking about poetry, we're we're also a country which, on the whole, is more frightened of poetry than most people. It's yeah. a market which is which is harder to get uh, to make success of poetry. Yeah. Um, on the whole, translated poetry is going to be more difficult than uh, in this country than selling first language fiction. Um, and one of the things that I think happens quite a lot is you'll find a lot of people who are, who are publishing poetry and who are translating poetry, um, as Clive was saying, you're not making fortunes from this and people do it for the love of it. And there is there's, there's almost a whole other economy happening. People who yeah. make money doing some other thing and out of the love of it will be translating poetry or, or writing poetry and publishing poetry. And, the, and the, 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 what we'll call the business model um, sort of, uh, is, is, is rather different from a lot of, a lot of publishing. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, excellent. That's exactly the, re I mean, the reaction I wanted. Thank you. <laughs> the point about poetry is, is, is got, it hasn't got such a wide market, but it's cheaper to produce. Mm. Because the tra the translate the, 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 most of the costs of producing a book in a minority language or presumably any language uh, into English is that is is the translation mm. cost, and those need, uh, those are easily borne um, if it's a slim volume where you have um, you, you know sort of, um, uh, translate it. And it's obviously a lot lot more costly to produce mm. a book um, of the length of um, the Tin Drum. Sure. Yes, the, the translator will be paid by the yard, essentially. I mean, God knows how some, um, you know, some of these um, uh, books, you know, the, the publishers ever get back any money, mm. to be honest with you. I, uh, with a novel, I have absolutely no idea, apart from the fact that most of the costs must be borne by the Spanish government or the German government or whoever. Mm. I don't. I don't understand their business model, but I. But I work on a on a sort of micro markets. I mean, I, if I can do a thousand copies of a book, I, you know, in, in a minority language, I can probably find a thousand people that want to buy it. Hmm. I, I know them personally, probably, you know, eventually. Many of you are in this room. All joining this club. Most you of you are here. That. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Before you leave, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, can I can I ask you um, then for a for a a Prescription. Uh, we need there to be more money coming from somewhere, uh, Clive. Uh, are we talking then about, as a kind of ideal model, are we talking about subventions from national organizations, state organizations, cultural organizations to pay for translation costs, to pay for marketing? I mean, I think we should be as precise as we can about what we would like to happen, if you see what I mean. What would make your okay. what would make your, your, well, your life? Well, <clears throat> you know, the heightening cultural awareness of the importance of translation, I think, must happen, you know, across the board, in, not just in educational setups, but you know, in, in the media as well. The media need to be informed. Um, translating in to and out of a language is is a very important p part of the future life of that language. Mm. I mean, when we consider. Uh, major events in the history of translation, the translation of something like Don Quixote, Cervantes. <laughs> Look how th something like that changes the literary map of the world. A Thousand and One Nights, the Bible. Um, w when, when great works are translated, uh, you know, this filters through and, and, and has, has an effect that's you know, incalculable. So I think we, we, we must raise consciousness about the importance of translation. Certainly, I believe that translating into uh, lesser spoken languages such as Irish, Gaelic, Welsh, uh, 
enriches these indigenous languages uh, in, in many ways. It stretches uh, the limitations of, of, of existing, uh, shall we say, genres. It can introduce, it introduces new voices, new textures, very often even uh, new concepts, new, new words. New, you know, it stretches vocabulary as well. And it, it, it can bring in, as in, we'll say, the, these poems from, from South India, it, it brings in just a whole new climate, yeah? And I think that, that yeah. if this doesn't happen, then there's a grave danger of, the, of, of these smaller literatures becoming, as it were, too inward-looking, uh, too, too traditionalist, mm. uh, and you know, without experimentation and without opening to world literature and other voices, uh, we, 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 there is a danger of, of, a, of a narrowing of vision and of form. So, you know, for, for all these reasons, uh, I think that um, the life of a language, of a literary language, depends a lot on, on inward and outward translation. Mm. And in a sense, when we're thinking about, about ways of encouraging this, and particularly to do with, uh, to do with financial model and financial support, there are probably different models if we're talking about uh, to be crude about it, import and export. Well, the, the incentives are different for people who are trying to promote their own culture outwards and people who are thinking about how you can bring things in to enrich their own culture. Well, maybe some of the uh, multi-billionaire uh, publishing firms should be taxed. In other, words, in other words, a small proportion of their huge profits should go to translating Icelandic novels and whatnot. Or if they have any volunteers. Perhaps Amazon should pay their, their corporation points. tax. <laughs> also that. Can we, can we talk a little bit about... about process. There are obviously there is going to be an issue frequently translating between two languages where there aren't many speakers who are comfortable in both of those languages. This idea that one might use a bridge language, as, as Gabriel, you've talked about, um, and one might also use a sort of collaborative process where there might be someone who has the language, someone who, who's uh, a native speaker of the, the, the source language and someone who is, if you like, a writer in the target language. Um, maybe Gabriel first. You said uh, it's None of anyone's business how you get to. I, mean, what, Look, I, I, I think I think when it comes to translating poetry, yeah, uh, and mind you, there's an irony here in the sense that I have I have translated a number of Irish writers into Irish, including Beckett, Yeats, and Heaney. But we we'll leave that aside for the moment. But just let me say that there are two mantras out there in, in about 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 translating poetry. One is. Poetry is what's lost in translation. Fine. The other one is, poetry is what survives translation. Now, clearly, I'm in the latter camp, and I can prove it. Hmm. <laughs> could, could you not see... I mean, presumably there are some poets who would be anxious about the idea that their work is being is being recreated based on something over which they have no control. I mean, I think it's slightly different if we're talking about a poet who has translated their own work into English, as someone was, was saying. But there will be some cases where presumably you're working from, uh, from say, an English version, which was done by somebody who is not the original poet. Um, is, is there well, not, well, a, is yes, not a kind it, of anxiety it, well, it, on, it, on behalf of the original it, poet it, that somehow they're being not it, exactly misrepresented, but, but you're moving further and further away from this thing which is precious it, to it them? It worries me sometimes when I see a 20-line poem and I see a translation and it's 25 lines. I say, well, what has happened here, you know? Um, is somebody adding, adding on his own extra material? Mm. Uh, and in fact, I know a few translators who, are, who take too many liberties with, with text and who create something that, you know, you must create something new, but it shouldn't be so new that it, that it departs uh, radically from the original text. Mm. I think that um, a really conscientious uh, trans literary translator will do his best to be faithful to the original uh, work, and whether it's through a bridge language or not. And th the kind of metaphor I like to use for that is that, let's say that is the flame. The original work here is the flame. I think the translator must imaginatively enter into that fire and take the flame from the flame and be himself or herself as creative as possible. And in that way, mm. you will be very faithful to the spirit uh, and, and the contours and the textures of the original text. Whether it's true bridge language or not, you, the, the poet translator has, 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 I think, enough sympathy mm. with, with the original text. I mean, very often it's a labor of love. It's not mm. a commission. So you're doing it because you love, the, you, love what you're, you love what you're doing. So you're not going to defile what you love. Is that right? Okay. Can, can I say something, Danny? You, you mentioned um, 
the, some anxiety from the point of view of the, the author of the source text. Mm. Uh, speaking as, a, as an author now rather than a translator, I mean, I've, I've got to say, once, once your book goes out there, you have to sort of let it go in a way. It's a bit like your kids leaving home, you know. I mean, you, sometimes you just never hear from them again. Uh, sometimes they turn up 20 years later with a beard and a boyfriend and, uh, you know, and, uh, and they're doing very well, thank you, and they, they didn't tell you. You know, I mean, strange things happen. Sometimes they keep in touch and cling to you and keep bothering you and you just want them to leave. You know, the metaphor works very well. Um, but uh, you sort of have to let it go and strange things will happen to it. It will evolve and change. And translation is one of those things. And you have to relinquish something of it you know I mean you were the author you still are the author of that text in a way but it's now out there somewhere leading its own life and then what what step what steps it takes you know is, is something not entirely in your, in your control um, I, one of my novels was translated into French and it's a novel written in English as all my novels are uh, but this particular one notionally is set in a Welsh speaking medieval context and the translator was asking me about things like the genders of rivers. Now, because I wrote it in English, I didn't think about the genders of rivers, but she forced me to think of it, and I realized that she was actually attempting to translate it into something that reflected a Welsh original that wasn't even there. So, I mean, very strange, ironic things can, can turn up through translation, and you sort of have to go with this to an extent and there, I think there will, as, as Gabriel said, there will be good translation and bad translation. Talking about bridge translation, I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive. Everybody might think, well, that's crazy, isn't it? it how, how can that work? It, it's bound to degrade like photocopying a photocopy. But if it's done with the right kind of care, um, if it's done with the right kind of attentiveness, there's no reason why it should, because language isn't like that. It's not like photocopies. Um, uh, and I, I can think of an example. Uh, I was once translating a Greek poem into English. I don't speak in, in, into Welsh, rather. Don't speak any any Greek. The the I was with the author, and uh, she had a, an English translation of it. Alexandra Bushlow was in the audience. Uh, was was present at this particular workshop we were doing, and I can remember asking the author Maria Laina, "What gender is the tree?" It was a poem about a tree. Now, in English, you don't ask what gender a tree is. Um, but it makes sense to ask that question if you're translating into Welsh. And she said, oh, it's got to be a man. It's got to be male. It's very important to the poem. Mm. But of course, she didn't tell me that in the translation. Mm. So there are, there are two words for tree in Welsh, and you can choose a, a masculine or a feminine one. Suddenly, something was working in the poem in the Welsh translation that was invisible in the English version. So, I mean, it's not a photocopy of a photocopy. Uh, you can negotiate things that nuance and, and, and reflect. The, but the, the, uh, I mean, you, you get something in particular, though, from having direct access to the author in that case. Yeah. Um, it, it presumably it is different where you have the possibility, for example, of hearing how it sounded in the original and hearing, hearing the, 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 yeah. the original. Yeah. I, I, think the, I think the alternative, sorry, is, is a kind of a, uh, a sensitive reader as a go-between between, between you and the, and the original if you're doing a bridge translation. And you have to have a kind of a... Um, uh, a person you can turn to if the author themselves can't can't speak if they're either dead or they you know they there's no other way of communicating with them other than holding a seance um, uh, then a, a sensitive reader with some knowledge of the original can work there and uh, Carsten Sandivis and the Danish translator for instance has done this translating a great Welsh novel from the 1960s called In No Sola Leiad great uh, modernist masterpiece into Danish and, and in his case he was able to kind of reflect some of the dialect features of the original novel that just can't be there in English uh, in the Danish version. It, you know, there, there, are, there are things you can do. In fact, I'll have to add to that because this whole idea of, uh, I think the wonderful thing about my experience with translation has been the fact that the author has been in the same room. So it's no longer what uh, Umberto Eco says that, you know, the problem of negotiating with the, you know, the, the, the ghost the, the, not only the foreign text, but you know the, the absent author. When the author is present with you, the, it is also a matter of trusting the instinct of the translator both ways. It works both ways. Because uh, I do remember when you're talking of liberties, Gabriel, I remember uh, Garage McLaughlin in one of my poems, which was ironically enough called Translations, there's a line about hawks. And it's quite a violent image about the hawks landing without pulling in their claws. 
and in his translation he tra changed it to swallows and i was like how why did you do that he said there's too much violence in your poems so i have changed it to swallows so so you see what i mean that that's an extreme where you take a liberty and then you talk about it and you laugh about it and perhaps i mean it's obviously not going to work but i think i think uh, more often than not it's really about trusting the translator if when you're when i'm talking about my work entering say welsh which i don't know a word of uh, or any other language it's about trusting the translator to understand and to instinctively attune himself or herself to that to the universe of that poem it's not so much about getting the words right because i do remember tom morris translated a very small poem of mine called and this in which in the english i write in english the word hollow tree appears and he's translated it very differently and i remember somebody in the hay festival kerala standing up and saying but isn't there the a word for hollow tree in welsh and he said you know that's not the point it's not it's not matching it you're not ma you're not matching the exact word you're creating or hopefully carrying the emotional textures of the original into the translation and i think that can happen only if there is this kind of trust and dialogue between author translation and i think that's very rare unless you do it in a a uh, workshop scenario and in the workshop scenario i find the bridge language really works but two quick comments on how the bridge language can sometimes let you down is uh, at a very recent workshop in uh, with uh, this icelandic uh, writer novelist and poet gerdur krishni in her translation the, the english translation uh, both of us the, the the welsh poet and me realized that there were significant additions and changes for example a very precise line which said um, something about a promontory of land you know some a, uh, the house is on the edge of a point of land and i was asking her what is it is it a promontory is it a cliff because i thought that's very important she looked at her icelandic and she said it's not even there it's a neighborhood west of reykjavik so this was an addition the second mistake in her bridge language translation was in a poem where the uh, the translator had attempted to rhyme the poem and had very faithfully kept a four line uh, stanza rhyme, uh, rhyme the rhyme scheme was uh, correct but the content had been completely changed so if gerdur had and gerdur was not aware of this because she didn't think it essential to check the english translation if if we hadn't asked been so persistent and picky and just thought of cross check because she was there uh we would have uh you know we would have written a completely different it would have gone one stage further away from the original so i think one of the essential components is conversation and dialogue whether it's through the workshop format or emails or persistent back and forth if you can of course if the author is dead then you only have your good conscience to rely on so so one of the dangers is is kind of degrading as you go further and further away but like these kind of photocopies of photocopies but only when we're actually talking about a case where one of the stages is simply an inadequate piece of work mm -hmm. where something was simply done without the kind of care that is that is required of it and somehow you then lose access to th this something which was significant in the original um i feel like we've been kind of rushing through this conversation but we have in fact already got uh we've only got about 12 minutes left 13 minutes left for oh. questions from you and there are lots of you aren't there Excellent. Um so I think we'll stop our conversation and just allow you to um prompt us with some some questions please. And there is a microphone so please w give us a wave and we'll send the microphone to you. And we'll wait very patiently. And you'll be more embarrassed than we are so it's fine. Alice, thank you. Hi yeah. I just wanted to ask a little bit more about what can go wrong with the bridge translation and what would be the sort of safeguards because we've um heard in other events some real horror stories of well one particularly exaggerated one that a text went from finnish to swedish to english to arabic and by the time the two, the original and end versions were compared there was all sorts of stuff missing and added in so i wanted to hear more about yeah it's great if it works but how can that be guaranteed well, the other quick question for the publisher was just fascinating to know how much um Maybe it's a really obvious question. How much um, original publishing in those tiny languages like Cornish is there in the first place, and how do you see that relationship between the importance of it coming out into English and the importance of it actually being published in the Cornish? And just some more about that, if possible. Thank so, Gabriel, do you want to answer that first? The first well, question. The, the first question. Yeah, I think uh, th there's a danger sometimes 
that a, a translator might try to spice things up a bit or be a little bit too clever. I can think of one example. Uh, a distinguished Irish language poetess, Newell and Ironel, was translated by uh, a well-known poet uh, living in America, Paul Muldoon, and one of his volumes was called The Astrakhan Cloak. Oh, that sounds nice, The Astrakhan Cloak. But what, what people didn't know, who might be f going out to do a further translation of that into Hungarian or something, was that Paul was just being clever. Astrakhan is a kind of a pun on the Irish word for translation, which is Astrakhan. There's nothing at all about an Astrakhan cloak in the book. So do you follow what I mean? It's a, it's a meaningless pun when translated further into Hungarian or, or, or Slovene or something. Somebody in Ireland might get the pun from the title, but to continue that would be, would be ridiculous. Can I also respond to that? You know, the thing is, we tend to think that, okay, if this is one version, uh, then this is the only version. And I'm speaking of the bridge version here. Uh, there has been an experience in, again, in a workshop scenario where uh, a Swiss-German poet's uh, poem, uh, which depended heavily on wordplay, was translated uh, rather faithfully and uh, with, absolute, with an absolute lack of imagination and into the bridge version that we were given. And by some great fortune, we were happy to have the, uh, the, this, the, the poet Bill Herbert among us who took that bridge version. We sat with the original poet, Raphael, and he did a new poem based on that bridge version and his conversation. That poem got the word play just beautifully in English. As a result, for me to move it into Bengali became right because I had the right notes to play with. So my theory is that if you have a faulty bridge, it either needs to be repaired, demolished and built again. It's not like, I mean, of course it's a lot of hard work and you need, you need good people there to do it for you. But I do believe that this is possible if, for example, in the, as in this case, uh, there are poets translating other poets. Because then we have a sense of what is going on, you and it, know it's faulty, right? yeah, and you no, it it when you read something, it's you know the, a lot of what we forget about translation is that you do it by ear, instinctively when you're reading something, and you can get the sense that this is not, this is sounding stolid, or this is sounding stodgy, or this is sounding forced. There's something instinctual about the whole thing that a lot of the times we don't really pay any attention to, but I think it's very important, uh, listening and writing by ear and translating even by ear. So I think if there's, a, if there's a problem with the bridge language, it can be fixed if you're lucky enough to have the right people and to recognize the, 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 you know, the, the flaw in time. Then, then you're not in this danger of going so far away from the original. And of course, it doesn't always help to have the, the poet the living poet in the same room as you, because sometimes you ask the poet, what do you mean by that line? And he yes, uh, gives you a blank look, <laughs> blank stare. What did I mean? <laughs> Clive. Yeah, I'm, of course, I'm a complete fraud here um, because I, I'm not a translator. I just, you know, borrow the money and get them put into uh, hard copy. Um, but I will uh, say I, I did uh, attend a conference where John Rutherford, a very distinguished uh, translator from uh, Galician and Spanish, uh, said that uh, the, the, the translation, you, uh, for translation you need to get into the sand pit. You know, it's like a kind of childlike uh, a, a, a childlike ac activity, um, throwing things around and, and seeing how they go. He works with a, with a, um, a, a workshop I in Oxford, and, and they produce some fantastic translations from uh, from the Galician. Um, regarding the Cornish, hmm, well, there are uh, there are trans there are some. Um, there are some Cornish texts, uh, the sort of canonical texts, which get translated from time to time, the Bible, um, and uh, the recent, more recently, the Bunin's K, which was, a, which was a, a document that was in the National Library of Wales, which everyone thought was in Welsh, and then they discovered that it was actually Cornish, and they've, they've really produced a, a translation uh, of that. But um, mostly the, 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 the translation, the, the mostly, um, I, I mean, I do the translations. I'm practically the only person that does any uh, contemporary uh, literature. There is, there is some, um, but it, there is a, it's a very small market, as you can imagine. There's only about a thousand speakers, so um, you know you're not talking big bucks here. Uh, what I would say generally about translation um, is that uh, if you um, if you suggest to 
practically any poet or writer that you're prepared to um, uh, to translate their work uh, into English, and that's not just from Cornish, but from other uh, other European languages, they bite your hand off. Mm. The, the situation in Wales is rather different, actually, and there's a range of responses to being translated, and uh, there are some Welsh language writers who, who still are, are resistant to being translated into English. Yeah. And uh, there's a kind of a family of responses that goes from, well, let's give it a rest. I, I don't want my work translated. There's, a, there's a, an, an author, Tom Morris, who still uh, thinks in those terms. And there are others who actually translate their own work, and there are others who are very keen on being translated, and, and they're all points in between. And I, I think it's he actually healthy that there's a spectrum, you know? And I, and I think if, uh, in the case of these languages where you know, the language is still very much alive, it's actually a mistake for every single thing to be translated or for every single thing to be in a parallel text, as, uh, as happens quite a lot in Gaelic nowadays, I believe. You know? yeah. And uh, I, I think there's a danger that the author can be composing with the, the ghost of a translator looking over his shoulder, you know, which I think is, is not a healthy way to be. So I, I think it's good that there's a range of responses yeah, to that's that. A, that. That's a very fair point, actually. I mean, of course, what we haven't spoken about um, today is, is the, whole, the whole political issue of, um, of minority languages and uh, um, as a sort of bulwark against uh, globalization. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is the kind of the, the issue that some people don't want to be translated because they, they want to, you know, um, preserve their sort of the the, the, the autoch autochthonous uh, language mm -hmm. and culture. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know there obviously are going to be a range of, yeah. uh, of people on the spectrum about um, you know with their culture, language, and culture. Yeah, and some I can understand uh, the reluctance of certain Welsh <laughs> poets to be translated into English because some of the poets, like like Tom Morris, when when the, the verse craft itself is is the highlight of the piece. Yeah. Not what he's saying, but the dexterity uh, uh, and the superb handling of strict meters and so on. Well, uh, one, one might even be doing a disservice to some poets by translating them into English, because the result could be very flat indeed, mm. and all you all you end you might end up with really would be a, a prose crib to just say, well, look, try to enter into the original, you use this prose crib, but this prose crib can't stand as a work of art in itself, and this happens to you. Know. Of course, Tom, Tom translates, I think, between Welsh and Breton. I don't, does he do Irish as well? I'm not sure. No, uh, no, not, not Irish. Yeah. Because there's a difference, though, presumably, between not wanting your work translated into English and not wanting your work to be translated at all because you, you, you're only aware of the loss. Because presumably yeah. there are some of these people who are resistant to being translated into English for reasons that are as much political as anything else, yeah. who wouldn't necessarily object to being translated in, in principle. And I, th I think, I, I, I don't want to overplay this, we're talking about a very small number of people, but, uh, but, but there are also cases where people see the virtue of being translated into English is because that's the bridge. Mm. Because it can then be amplified, essentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can see you can see English as either a wall or a bridge, depending on how you imagine the situation. And that's that does also mean that that an enormous um, burden, if you like, is put on this thing because the, because the the more uh, flawed or the more degraded the English is, the, the greater the possibility for that to be to to, to be uh, amplified as the English is then used to go into more yeah. and more different languages. Um, I'm sorry to say we have, in fact, that was. Uh, <laughs> rather extensive uh, series of fascinating answers, and we've now run out of time. Uh, I'm sorry to say. I, I do hope you'll stay around the Translation Centre for more events. I have one announcement before you go, uh, which is, Alexander, I'm sure, is going to wave a copy. There we are. Uh, there's a pile of copies of books related to the European Literature Prize. Uh, there are lots of them, and they are free, so do please help yourself before you go. But before you do even that, please join me in thanking Chris and Clive and Gabriel and uh, Sam Furner. And also, Chris wants to say something, apparently. I, I didn't realize this was a time for shameless plugs, so, and I haven't had a chance to do one. So We I, also have a shameless plug a shameless before plug. we go. Uh, I'm, I'm giving a reading tonight at 6.30 in the Old Crown Pub at 33 New Oxford Street. Please come. Uh, if you all turn up, I don't know what we're going to do, but uh, they do have a bar. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we'll deal with that problem when we get there. See you this evening. Thank you.